Thank you everyone for joining me today uh, for my talk regarding the physics of a gamma tile program. Uh, I know it's uh, lunchtime for some of you out there, so I did want to let you know that I will be showing some video of uh, some brain surgery today, so fair warning to everyone out there. All right, a uh, quick disclosure, uh, I am a paid uh, medical physics consultant uh, for GT Medical Technologies. And as Ashley mentioned, uh, my name is Adam Turner and I am a medical physicist uh, based out of Phoenix, Arizona, uh, currently in San Antonio, Texas, covering a first case gamma tile implant. Uh, so uh, you can see my, uh, my beautiful hotel room behind me here. <clears throat> so to start the talk today, I just wanna kind of go over some real basics uh, about the use of brachytherapy in the brain. Uh, we know that brain tumors have a high recurrence rate following surgical resection. Um, a, a large reason for this is that minimal surgical margin uh, can be taken uh, through, with eloquent brain tissue uh, following resection. That, that results in a higher probability of leaving behind microscopic disease. So uh, because of that, um, it's been shown that adjuvant radiation therapy can improve outcomes. Uh, brachytherapy is one way of, of uh, using uh, the adjuvant radiation. And it does offer some advantages over external beam modalities. Uh, brachytherapy begins right at the time of tumor excision. Um, those, the sources are placed uh, directly following resection, uh, whereas external beam methods typically require uh, approximately two weeks uh, for wound healing and reduced swelling before treatment can begin. Uh, during that time, it's been shown that uh, the microscopic tumor cells left behind can begin uh, replicating <clears throat> Leading to, uh, leading to issues uh, with, with missed targets, and uh, that, that brachytherapy has uh, some advantages over. So there are some limitations, however, uh, with LDR brachytherapy treatments. Uh, we know that uh, the use of loose or stranded seeds uh, can leave behind very high dose uh, hotspots, which can result in uh, spots of necrosis and eloquent brain tissue. Uh, we also know that uh, it's difficult to uniformly space out loose or stranded seeds, uh, resulting in a non-uniform dose distribution, especially for larger cavities. Uh, finally, uh, any tumor uh, resection cavities um, that are, are deep or regularly shaped can be difficult to access uh, by the neurosurgeon. So there's obviously a need for an improved LDR brachytherapy delivery system. Um, because necessity is the mother of innovation, uh, the gamma tile brachytherapy system was developed to offer all the advantages of LDR brachytherapy and address some of those limitations uh, of, of the alternative techniques I mentioned before. So the current indications for use of, of gamma tile is uh, for newly diagnosed malignant uh, intracranial neoplasms, so new METs, as well as all recurrent intracranial neoplasms. Just to very quickly touch on some of the clinical outcome data, um, gamma tile has been shown to double the time uh, before recurrence uh, in patients with previously recurrent meningiomas and brain mets. And additionally, it uh, has show, shown improved overall survival versus other treatment modalities in patients with uh, recurrent high-grade gliomas. Uh, you can see uh, a much more robust uh, version of the clinical data by visiting gtmedtech.com. Um, there have been some other great webinars given by some of our uh, physician consultant teams that go over this data in, in much more detail. <clears throat> the focus of my talk today will be, uh, I'm going to start out by, by discussing some of the, the design features that, that lead to some of these improved outcomes uh, when using the gamma tile system. So the, what is the gamma tile? Uh, it's a bioresorbable collagen seed carrier uh, that measures two centimeters by two centimeters with a four millimeter thickness. Um, the material that the gamma tiles are made of are, is a very commonly used uh, neurosurgery product that is used for dura matter repair. Uh, it's used over and over and over again in neurosurgery just without any radioactive seeds. Um, this material is it's sticky when wet, uh, it's suturable, and it's also uh, cuttable, so it can be uh, trimmed in surgery. Um, the gamma tile has four cesium-131 seeds embedded uh, per tile. Um, these seeds have a one centimeter center to center seed spacing and a uh, fixed source strength of 3.5 U per seed. 
So the purpose of that seed strength and seed uh, placement is to provide a nominal dose of 60 gray to five millimeters depth in brain tissue. So first uh, you might ask why, you, why you use cesium-131? If you look at this, uh, this simple table here, you can see cesium-131 versus some of other, the other commonly used uh, LDR brachytherapy seed isotopes. Uh, the, first, the second column there shows that the, the average gamma energy uh, actually compares uh, very, very uh, well with, with these other uh, isotopes. So there's, um, there's not too much of a difference in the actual uh, dose, uh, dose distribution in terms of the energy of the seed. However, uh, we know that brain lesions recur frequently and quickly. So it's imperative to deliver that dose in a much faster uh, manner than with some of the uh, alternative seeds available. So you can see that the cesium half-life of 9.7 days uh, means that it only takes 64 days to deliver 99% of, of its dose that, that that seed will be delivering. Uh, comparing that to iodine or palladium, uh, you can see that cesium-131 is a better choice in terms of delivering uh, it's dose faster, which could possibly result in a higher biological effective dose. Uh, and given that, and given that uh, rapid dose delivery could result in better outcomes. Additionally, uh, the gamma tile has a, the seeds are placed in an asymmetric manner. Uh, if you look at this cross-sectional view, um, there's a thick side and a thin side to the seeds where the uh, thick side, it, provides a three millimeter offset between the radiation source and the operative bed. This, this is meant to prevent seed to brain contact uh, and effectively move the hot spot out of the brain into the collagen material. I can illustrate that here. Uh, this, this is a plot that shows uh, the dose from a distribution of uh, 12 seeds uh, placed uniformly as if, uh, as you'd see with a three tile placement. So you can see that uh, one mil, one, uh, point, point one, um, excuse me, one millimeter from the seed, you get a very high dose of, of uh, exceeding 700 gray. So if you place that offset that the gamma tile provides, um, you can see in this red box here, uh, the, that three millimeters away from the seed, you're reducing that hot spot down to uh, below 200 gray. Um, and as I mentioned, effectively moving that hot spot into the collagen material and out of the brain. And you can see in the blue box on the plot, that the dose within the, the five millimeter treatment area is actually fairly uniform compared to what you would get with, with raw seeds placed uh, directly into the brain tissue. Additionally, uh, the, uh, any uh, adjacent tiles placed next to each other will maintain that one centimeter seed to seed distance. Uh, this this uh, results in a more uniform dose distribution um, at clinically relevant depths and minimizes uh, hot and cold spots uh, laterally across the tile. And again, here's a plot that shows the lateral dose profile across the, the center of a three tile implant. The, uh, the thicker uh, red line there shows, the, uh, shows the, the dose at five millimeters depth. Um, you can see that uh, there's not a lot of um, oscillating hot and cold spots once you get out to that five millimeter depth uh, distance. Uh, meaning a, a more uniform dose to your, your, your um, target area. So <clears throat> that was some of the kind of theoretical underpinnings of, of why you might want to use gamma tile. I'm not going to move on to some of the more practical considerations of how to set up a gamma tile program um, and what a med medical physicist's role is in running um, a program. So the first thing I want to mention is that this truly is a collaboration. Um, between a radiation oncologist, a neurosurgeon, and a medical physicist. Uh, all three of these uh, players play very pivotal and important roles in a gamma tile program, and the program couldn't be run without, without any, of, uh, any of the three. <clears throat> so this, is, uh, this slide just kind of gives a, a highlight that I'm gonna, I'm gonna delve into each one individually, but this, this just shows what is uh, kind of the overview of a medical physicist's role uh, for the use of gamma tile. So first and foremost, uh, medical physicists are typically responsible for overseeing all the regulatory issues uh, associated with using cesium-131. Um, this includes uh, making sure the radioactive materials license are uh, appropriate 
and uh, allowable for receiving and storing cesium-131, as well as uh, updating and, and maintaining uh, radiation safety pr uh, program, um, making sure that policies and procedures are such that uh, you're optimizing the use of cesium-131 while maintaining a safe environment for your hospital staff. Um, pr prior to, uh, Prior to the implant for a, for a given patient, uh, medical physicists are involved uh, with collaborating with the physician team to determine the number of tiles that will be needed for each given patient. They're typically the ones who are actually placing the order with GT Medical Technologies. And they're the ones who are uh, typically receiving um, the gamma tile order and, and performing measurements uh, to verify seed activity. And again, I'll go into these things in, in a few slides here. Uh, on the day of implant, um, medical physicists are typically the ones uh, bringing gamma tiles into the room from the hot lab, um, and overlooking that, uh, that radioactive material until it gets handed over to the neurosurgeon. Um, and then following, <clears throat> following the implant, uh, they're typically the ones performing exposure surveys uh, to verify that patients can be released back into the public. Finally, uh, from the post-implant perspective, um, the medical physicists are tasked with calculating uh, the isodoses using post-implant CT and MRI imaging. So uh, now I'm gonna kind of delve into these things in a little more detail. So first I'm gonna talk about um, kind of the groundwork that goes into establishing a gamma tile program. So first and foremost, uh, in order to receive uh, your cesium-131 uh, sources from gamma tile, uh, we, we, must need, we must have a, a valid radioactive materials license. Um, we, uh, the, the seeds used in a gamma tile, uh, again, a gamma tile is, uh, is the isoray model uh, CS-1 revision 2 seed, which has a NRC sealed source and device registry number. Uh, it's also listed on the AAPM and IROC uh, registry of brachytherapy sources. And it's, uh, it's, it's full set of AAPM TG43 uh, dose calculation parameters were published in the update one, supplement one document in 2017. So if your site uh, is, is needing to do a RAM license amendment, um, a few things to remember um, are that uh, radioactive materials are typically regulated uh, by the, internal, the total internal activity of the seeds. Uh, this is different than the apparent activity so I like to point that out just to make sure everyone is on the same page when they're talking about their activities. Um, in order to calculate the total internal activity for cesium-131, uh, you can simply take the, uh, the air chroma seed strength and multiply it by the, a factor of 2.124. And so that can be used as, as a quick calculation of, of, uh, to estimate how much total internal activity you may have at your site. Uh, when, when doing a license amendment, uh, you're typically tasked with specifying um, and requesting the maximum activity of a given isotope that you could have at your site. Uh, to do this, we, we want you to consider the number of expected gamma tile procedures you may, your site may be running, as well as uh, factoring in any pot potential unused and, and in storage gamma tiles, uh, loose seeds and possible waste. And with all that being said, for a larger site, we, we recommend a, a maximum activity request of about three or to five curie. Um, oftentimes, uh, it's also nece necessary to um, uh, request a total maximum seed activity. So uh, just, just to make sure you can uh, receive your, your seeds uh, early, we recommend a maximum seed activity of about 10 millicurie per seed. Um, GT Medical Technologies uh, is here to help with, with any necessary documentation that you may need for your amendment application. Uh, we can help out every step of the way, so don't hesitate to reach out if that's uh, something you're, you're going through. As far as um, generating radiation safety policies and procedures, um, we want to recognize that the radiation safety programs are uh, fully administered by local radiation safety committees and the radiation safety officers. Uh, your standard radiation safety policies for, for LDR procedures like prostate seed implants or eye plaque procedures are typically sufficient for gamma tile. Um, and we also always recommend that perioperative staff, so the OR staff, the ICU staff, uh, are trained in principles of ALARA, time distance shielding, you know, standard uh, radiation safety principles. 
And again, we have plenty of uh, uh, templates of documents that you may want to use, uh, including a full, full policies and procedures uh, kind of generic template that can be uh, modified for your individual institution. So upon your first order, you will uh, receive a welcome kit uh, that includes some documentation like some patient information sheets, uh, brochures, uh, implant cards, things like that. Um, most importantly, we will provide you two stainless steel trays that get sent to the operating room. Uh, these trays are intended to uh, be sterilized for each procedure. And these are the trays that the, uh, the tiles will be transferred into on the day of implant um, to, to maintain a sterile environment. But uh, those, those get delivered uh, upon your first order and they can be reused over and over again. So how does the pre-planning and ordering process work? So <clears throat> the concept of, of pre-planning for a gamma tile program, uh, there's, there's not a uh, pre-implant dosimetry calculation that's performed. Instead, the, the goal is to uh, estimate the, uh, the surface area of your resection cavity, which you can then use to calculate the number of tiles that will be needed for that patient. So we recommend using a, uh, a recent uh, pre-op contrast MRI that clearly shows the lesion. Um, from that, um, you can consider things like the mass effect, which basically is where uh, when the resection occurs, uh, do out, outward pressures in the brain will kind of make the cavity collapse a little bit, um, maybe reducing your, your total surface area. Uh, also, we, we recommend ex, uh, excluding areas of the operative bed that you know you won't be placing tiles. Uh, this can be areas um, near the skull where the uh, craniotomy is actually going to occur or areas near uh, critical structures like op optical uh, structures in the optical path, as well as brainstem, things like that. So the general idea uh, is to come up with a uh, expected surface area of your cavity, and then by dividing by the surface area of a gamma tile, which is four centimeters squared, uh, you can get an integer number of, of required tiles with a little rounding. We always recommend ordering at least one extra tile. Um, that's just in case uh, the neurosurgeon is able to fit in an extra tile or an extra half tile in an area they may not have uh, thought they were going to place one earlier, or in the, uh, the worst case scenario where a tile accidentally gets dropped, uh, obviously making it useless to use. So I'm going to go through a few different recommendations we have for how to do this surface area estimate in order to uh, determine the number of tiles needed. So the first couple are uh, more rough approximations, but we found that they work very well clinically. So if you have a, uh, a tumor type that you would define uh, as more like planar, kind of rectangular in nature, uh, maybe something like a meningioma that's more uh, on the surface of the, of the, of the brain, uh, you, can, you can actually go ahead and just uh, approximate this as a rectangle. And the surface area is simply just the product of the major dimensions of the lesion. So in the example I'm showing here, uh, we, we have a uh, tumor with a five centimeter extent on the axial slice and about a four centimeter extent on the coronal slice. Um, from that, you get about 20 centimeters squared, divide that by four, and you come up with five gamma tiles. And that is what was used for this patient. So if you wanna get uh, a bit more complex with your modeling, um, you can uh, approximate the surface area of more irregularly shaped or, or 3D cavities as ellipsoids. So for this, we just recommend using uh, the three major uh, image um, orientations, the, the sagittal, the coronal, and the axial, uh, coming up with a series of, of um, major dimensions uh, in, in each of those planes. Uh, and just using, um, really you can just use an online calculator uh, to solve for the surface area of an ellipsoid. Uh, I, I put one here that, that I found with a quick Google search, um, but you can see the equation there, or you can go, just go ahead and enter that in. And we found that this to, is to be a really quick and easy way of pretty accurately estimating uh, how many tiles will be needed. Finally, uh, the most accurate method of coming up with your, your service area is to use a software solution. So in this case, you would, you would utilize a commercially available contouring software that allows you to contour the lesion that's, that's visible on the MRI, perform any contraction tools uh, to model that mass effect that you might expect to occur during the resection, 
as well as add any exclusion volumes uh, directly by contouring on the patient. Um, so this, uh, this image on the screen here shows a, a software program that will report back to you the surface area of, of a number of different uh, contours, um, specifically your contracted lesion minus the exclusion areas, uh, which is, is usually your most accurate surface area to use uh, to calculate the number of tiles that are needed. So as far as the order lead time, um, the order lead time depends on the date with which the order is placed. Uh, you can see in the table here that um, if, uh, if an order is needed on uh, Thursday, we would need that to be placed by Monday. Um, and you can, you can go ahead and take a look at the table and we can provide this information to you as well. Um, we, we always recommend ordering as far as in advance as possible and having the, the package being delivered one to two days prior to surgery. Uh, that, first of all, allows for a little bit of a buffer time in case there's issues with the delivery, uh, as well as allowing you time to receive the seeds uh, and perform any activity verification um, measurements that you are going to do prior to the day of the implant. So the actual ordering process um, is, is something that uh, upon your uh, first order, GT Medical Technologies will walk you through and will give you customer support on um, for as long as you need to until you get it down. But uh, it's essentially just getting an account, um, the order administrator at your institution, which typically is the medical physicist, will get a username and password. And um, our customer service person uh, always likes to say this is easy as Amazon. Um, that's really the uh, the intent here is basically just to go to this uh, website, click new order, and um, we do require uh, the date of the procedure, uh, the date of the delivery, um, an authorized user who will be in the system that you can select from a list, as well as the, uh, the name of the patient, the number of tiles, um, the number of loose seeds you'd like for that patient, and any other special instructions. and any kind of uh, support you, ever, you, you need for the ordering process. So what actually arrives in a gamma tile package? Um, these gamma tile uh, orders are shipped via FedEx Priority Alert. Um, each box includes up to 12 gamma tiles uh, and they are shipped in uh, the stainless steel trays I mentioned earlier. Of course, these are not uh, sterilized. Um, the, the tiles themselves are included inside of a a Tyvek envelope, um, and they have been sterilized with electron beam sterilization. Uh, so everything inside of that envelope is sterile. Um, each order will include a, a small lead pig with at least one loose seed um, for activity verification, um, as well as uh, a packet of source documentation paperwork. So that paperwork includes a certificate of analysis. So this is a uh, some statistics about all the seeds, um, the activity of the seeds measured um, by the vendor uh, for, your, for your order, uh, as well as a uh, confirmation assay that includes the actual air karma measured for each one of your seeds. So this is, uh, this is um, a measurement of the, the seeds located inside the sterile tiles and can be used and kept for your documentation. Uh, we also include a radiograph uh, showing an image of each one of the gamma tiles. Uh, so you can see that there's four seeds placed in each tile. And finally, um, uh, guidance instructions for any kind of return uh, that you may need to make. So just a quick word on the activity verification. Um, the AAPM Low Energy uh, Breaking Therapy Source Calibration Working Group recommends that for sterile source assemblies like gamma tile, um, that physicists order an assay, uh, non-sterile loose seeds equal to about 5% of the total. So uh, because of this, all gamma tile orders will include at least one loose seed from the same batch of seeds used to build your tiles. Um, and more loose seeds can be ordered, uh, can be specified when placing your order. So you can always get more of those if you'd like. Um, and then of course, we just recommend using the standard methods of a, of a, a reentrant well chamber with an LDR seed holder. Uh, and obtaining a calibration factor for cesium-131. Um, we can help with the calibration of your well chamber, um, either by uh, helping out getting that calibrated by uh, an accredited dose calibration laboratory or providing a calibration seed 
uh, with an exact activity uh, certificate associated with it um, for uh, in-house calibration. All right, so what does the actual implant procedure workflow look like? So on the day of a procedure, um, the tumor section is obviously being done by the neurosurgeon. Um, this takes two to three hours, um, depending on the difficulty, difficulty of the case. Uh, the case I did this morning actually took more than that. Um, so it can be a bit of a, a logistics uh, dance as far as determining exactly when the tiles will be needed at the end of the case. Um, typically tissue samples are, are sent out for pathologic confirmation of disease. Uh, this is especially true for things like brain mets, where uh, recurrent brain mets, where there's a potential for um, the, the imaging to show necrosis rather than uh, tumor disease. So you always want to co confirm what you're dealing with uh, tumor histologies and not uh, necro necrotic tissue. So at the time, uh, post-resection, uh, gamma tile package is brought into the room, typically by a medical physicist or a member of the nuclear medicine or radiation safety team. And at that point, um, the gamma tiles are transferred into the sterile field. So this is when they're placed into those uh, sterile stainless steel trays uh, I mentioned earlier. So once, uh, once that occurs, and I'll, I'll uh, give in some examples and show some, some uh, images in a second uh, to illustrate that, um, but the gamma tile, it really only takes five to 15 minutes to place these things uh, in, into, the, the, into the resection cavity. Um, typically, the radiation oncologist um, comes and scrubs in um, and stands at the shoulder of the neurosurgeon and uh, can help direct exactly where to place each tile. Uh, that's totally up to you and your institution as far as uh, how involved the radiation oncologist uh, gets. Uh, they can be scrubbed in, uh, they can be in the room, or uh, they can just stop by. Um, that's that's all, all based on your policies. Um, following the implant of the gamma tiles, uh, an exposure survey is, is usually performed after the craniotomy is closed. Um, I'll go through this in a second, but we typically find that the ex measured exposure uh, after the bone flap is placed back onto the, um, into the patient's uh, craniotomy, the measured exposure is low enough at that point for the patient to be uh, released to the public. Uh, obviously, the patient's not going to be going home that day or that night. Um, but it's nice to know that uh, at the time um, of closure, uh, the patient is um, uh, eligible to be released uh, to the general public. So here's kind of just the, the workflow of what happens um, in, to transfer the tiles into the sterile field. So as I mentioned, uh, inside the delivery tray uh, is a Tyvek envelope with sterile contents of the gamma tiles inside. Um, these can be uh, opened up by the medical physicist, um, being careful not to contaminate the actual plastic tray containing the tiles. Um, sterile forceps, typically being held by the radiation oncologist or, or scrub nurse, uh, can be grabbed and placed into the sterile stainless steel tray. Um, at that point, we always recommend closing the tray, um, taking a time out just to make sure everybody knows that there's now radioactivity in the room. Um, and keeping that tray closed at all, as much as possible uh, when the tiles are not being directly hand handled. So there's a, a small uh, plastic snap pack pla cover um, on top of the, the tray holding the gamma tiles, so you can just pop that off. Uh, we recommend a sterile marker uh, is used to place small dots on the smooth top side of the gamma tiles. Uh, that smooth side is actually the one millimeter thin side of the gamma tile, which should be the, the, uh, the, the, the side of the tile facing you uh, after placement in the brain. So we find uh, by placing an, uh, a mark, uh, it's, it's just a nice visual cue that the orientation of the tile is being pl uh, properly placed in the brain. Uh, once that's done, um, the gamma tiles can then be wetted. You can just use uh, some sterile saline, um, spray down right in the tray to get the, tam uh, the tiles uh, nice and, and wet. And um, finally, at that point, uh, forceps can, can be used to take out uh, individual tiles. And you can see in the picture there that um, the sliding stainless steel tray is being slid back just enough to allow access to one tile, uh, again, minimizing exposure to uh, the folks in the room. 
So here's kind of a, a photo of, of uh, some of those steps. Uh, you can see on the picture on the left, um, <clears throat> a purple marker was used to mark the, the top smooth side of the gamma tiles and uh, stateral salines being applied right inside of the tray. And on the right, um, they, uh, just, they're just using a pair of long forceps to pull up the tiles one by one and place them into the brain. I uh, would recommend with the, uh, the shot on the right there that they close that tile or the tray a little more, uh, again, just to, to really minimize exposure as much as possible. So um, this is the part where I'm going to go ahead and just play a, a, a video here that actually shows a, a gamma tile placement. Uh, so this is a glioma patient. Um, this is a patient that was on the clinical trial. So we don't actually recommend doing measurements in the brain with a ruler like this anymore. Um, but you can see how uh, simply and quickly these tiles are, are placed in the brain. Um, they adhere very well to the, uh, the sidewalls of the resection cavity. And finally here, you can see that the uh, a half tile is being placed. Um, and I didn't mention that earlier, but these tiles can be uh, cut. So you can get a half tile with two seeds uh, if, if that's needed to go ahead and, and um, place it in a smaller, smaller uh, area that a full tile will not fit in. Here's one more, oh, apologize. Here's one more example. This is a, is a meningioma case. Uh, so this is one of those more planar type um, cases where uh, there's not a, a 3D volume uh, with which to line the sides and bottom. Instead, um, they're gonna go ahead and remove the gross tumor and place these tiles um, kind of in a planar fashion. You can see that the, uh, the neurosurgeon is actually placing these tiles uh, underneath the skull, which effectively extends the craniotomy, uh, giving, giving more control further out in the brain. So in this case, the, uh, the neurosurgeon is going to go ahead and place those um, around the craniotomy site under the skull and then use a series of half tiles here to uh, place some dose right over the, uh, the area where the tumor was cut out. Um, this also gives you the ability to... Um, not place dose in areas where you may not want it. So you can see there that there's a, a patch without any tiles um, that was chosen uh, not to be covered, uh, just possibly because of the vessel there. Um, but this really, really illustrates uh, the, the, the power of surgically targeted radiation therapy, uh, where in surgery, you can, you can uh, exactly place the dose where you want. Okay, so following the procedure, um, we do recommend that the radiation exposure survey is done. Um, probably most folks on the talk today are aware of the regulations that, that govern uh, when, when a patient may be released to the public. But the, um, the overarching idea is that licensees can release patients if they are not likely to expose uh, any, any individual in the general public to, to more than a half rem. Um, the, the new reg 1556 document gave a model-based procedure so that you could calculate for a given radiation isotope what the exposure measurement at one meter would be in order for that patient to meet the criteria of the half rem exposure. So for cesium-131, um, that value is actually 6 MR per hour at one meter. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, we've yet to have a case that I'm aware of um, where the one, me one meter exposure measurement was above six MR per hour. Usually it's, it's well below that. Uh, one thing I also like to point out is that uh, it's typically a good idea and best practice to look at the, oh, apologize, to look at the, uh, the energy correction factors for your uh, exposure, exposure meter. Uh, typically these things are calibrated uh, using maybe cesium-137 with a, with a much higher energy. The, uh, the 30 keV photon of cesium-131 can actually uh, require a correction factor uh, for some of these chambers of up to 20%. So I just like to point that out. Um, you know, it's something that when we're actually recording actual values, it's always good to uh, make sure your correction factors are, um, are appropriate for the energy you're measuring. So just a couple um, tips and tricks that we've picked up from doing these uh, over, over the, uh, do, doing a number of these cases. Uh, first and foremost is communication with the operating room staff is, is key. Um, you know, these, uh, th these folks in the operating room um, typically are not used to dealing with radioactive material. Um, so they can, 
they can be a little uh, little nervous around it. It can be a, a little bit intimidating. So it's always a good idea to perform a timeout um, to verify, okay, the radioactive material is, is now um, in the room um, and we are gonna go ahead and place it inside of a shielding tray. But please, uh, please start u- utilizing the principles of time, distance, and shielding uh, to, to minimize your individual exposure. Uh, for those of us who are not often in an operating room, um, it's extremely important to remember that the sterile field is king inside of an operating room. Uh, we need to maintain that sterile field at all costs. Uh, some ways to do that um, for gamma tile specifically, we recommend avoiding using any kind of small little mayo stand for placing the stainless steel trays on. Uh, these things are a bit heavy um, and they can cause some unbalance. And the last thing you want is to drop these um, and contaminate the gamma tiles, rendering them useless, or uh, have anything non-sterile run into the sterile field that the neurosurgeon's working out of. So it's, uh, it's really good, especially on your first or second case, to have a plan for transferring these gamma tiles into the sterile field and to go over that plan with everyone involved. And as far as radiation safety goes, um, we obviously want to minimize the time with which uh, tiles are, um, are, are out in the open, uh, unshielded. So what, we've seen, what I've seen happen actually is after the placement of the tiles into the brain, um, the bone flap that goes back to cover the craniotomy uh, requires some hardware uh, drilled into it. If that's not done ahead of time, it can take 10 to 20 minutes to prepare that bone flap for reattachment. So we recommend making sure that's done prior to inserting the gamma tiles, uh, really just to minimize that exposure time to the, everyone in the room. Um, and, and piggybacking off of that, uh, the, the entire closing procedure should be done in a timely fashion. Uh, oftentimes in teaching hospitals, they'll have residents come in to do the closing uh, after, um, after the neuro, neurosurgeons, attending neurosurgeons do the case. Uh, well, if they're not in the room ready to go at the time of placement, um, again, it can just, uh, it can just um, increase that exposure time. And, you know, time, distance, and shielding, you know, we say it all the time, but uh, it's, it's an import, uh, very important concepts, um, very easy to, uh, to abide by, and it's just a great, a great thing to remind everyone in the room. Okay, so uh, following the procedure, um, here are some recommendations we have for the post-procedure workflow. Um, we recommend that uh, in addition to the standard contrast MRI that's going to be ordered for any, any patient undergoing neurosurgery, uh, also a thin slice non-contrast CT be ordered. So that's not normally ordered, um, but we want to make sure that that does occur for gamma tile patients to be used for the dosimetry calculation. So a combination of the MRI, um, which can be used to identify any Gross, uh, gross tumor left over after a maximum safe resection, and any nearby critical structures, as well as the thin slice CT, uh, can be used to perform a, uh, a nice uh, dose calculation and dose evaluation uh, from, from the gamma tiles. Uh, the dose calculation itself, um, obviously we recommend using standard dose formalisms like the APM TG43, uh, homogeneous uh, formalism, or possibly in the future as it becomes more and more popular, um, using this model based TG186 uh, formalism. And any commercial LDR brachytherapy software platform can be used. Um, and one, one important um, and, and nice uh, outcome of that is that the, uh, in addition to getting information about the dose of the patient, um, you can also then bill a uh, 77317 or 77318 in the radiation oncology department, uh, which is the brachytherapy isodose plan. And that's um, documentation of the dose calculation w- is typically needed for that. Uh, GT Medical will provide the source model specifications for the uh, cesium-131 seed that we use. Um, and this can obviously be used for commissioning your treatment planning software um, or performing any kind of secondary dose calculations, hand calculations that you uh, may want to do. So here's our um, kind of walkthrough real quick on how we recommend uh, the dosimetry be evaluated in the patient. Um, in order to uh, actually <clears throat> uh, contour in the resection cavity, we, we recommend first starting with 
uh, contouring the, the seeds um, using just a, a nice basic pixel intensity thresholding uh, tool. And you can see that in uh, the picture there. It's a little small, but you can see the, uh, the pink outline there of the seeds. Uh, if you then do a three millimeter expansion of those seeds, um, that's meant to represent the three millimeter offset provided by the gamma tile uh, to, the brain, to the brain surface. Uh, so that three millimeter expansion should actually be a nice representation of the, uh, the resection itself. Um, in the workflow we've developed, we actually call this the GT gamma tile, GTV. Um, at this point, you can use the MRI to, to contour any residual tumor that may still exist um, and combine that with that resection cavity. Um, and finally, uh, a five millimeter expansion of, of, that, uh, of that combination will give you what we call the GTPTV. So this is a five millimeter expansion of the resection cavity meant to represent the five millimeter a written directive prescription do depth dose that I mentioned earlier in the talk. So this is, a, this is your target volume that you'd like to uh, assess the prescription dose against. Um, at that point, you can use the, the tools in your uh, software to locate seeds and calculate the dose and evaluate dose statistics. Um, we recommend looking at the, uh, the volume of the PTV receiving 60 gray, um, as well as the D90, the dose delivered 90% of the PTV. And finally, of course, um, and dose to any normal stru structures of interest. Um, I will mention um, that GT has a collaboration with MIM software. Um, as, as probably most of you know, MIM software is a, uh, an image processing um, software company that um, has the, gives you the ability to use uh, semi-automated workflows that are, are, uh, that are custom uh, made by users that facilitate fast and reproducible task completion. Well, GT has collaborated with MIM uh, to create uh, two workflows, a pre-implant workflow, which walks you through all the steps necessary uh, to define the areas to be treated on a pre-op MRI and calculate the surface areas I mentioned earlier in order to get the number of required tiles, as well as a post-implant workflow um, that walks you through that, uh, that dosimetry calculation I just mentioned. And the great thing about this is this is actually uh, a free freeware, free, um, freely available to all gamma tile users. Uh, so if you don't have or don't want to use um, any existing LDR brachytherapy software, um, you can talk to us about um, getting access to this uh, MIM software. So just some quick closing remarks, uh, probably kept you long enough here, but I just wanna make it clear that medical physicists are vital uh, to the Gamma Tile program, and they uh, play a crucial role in establishing the program, um, all the pre-implant, implant, and post-implant duties. Um, the GT Medical Technologies has uh, an amazing customer support program. Uh, we will help every step of the way from amending your RAM license uh, providing sample documents and templates, doing case, individual case reviews, um, as well as uh, looking at your pre-implant imaging uh, to help you determine the number of tiles uh, until you feel comfortable doing that on your own, and also reviewing um, post-implant dosimetry with you just to, to assess how well the case went, and finally helping with any material return that, that you may need to, to do. So with that, I wanna thank you for your attention. Um, my email address is here on the screen. I'm happy to uh, get back to you with any, on any questions uh, that pertain to medical physics. Um, and addition, in addition to that, uh, if, if there's any uh, questions about uh, establishing the program or um, the workflow of the actual programs, uh, please, con please don't hesitate to, to, to contact me. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Turner. That was a great presentation. Um, and we did get quite a few questions. So. I'll start with those. The first question is, what are the typical exposure rates you measure after the bone flap is replaced and the patient is closed up? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so once the bone flap is, uh, is covered, it's, uh, it obviously depends quite a bit on the number of tiles um, and the exact location, uh, the depth of their placement. So it can vary, but um, I've seen anything down from uh, one MR per hour up to uh, five and a half MR per hour. 
again, I've never seen anything greater than uh, six, um, which is that release uh, criteria for cesium-131. Um, but uh, yeah, once the bone flap is replaced, most of those photons are being attenuated. Great, thank you. What happens when a patient's native cranium is not able to be used? What is your recommendation? Uh, great question. Um, we, I've seen one case where a plastic prosthetic was, uh, was placed uh, instead of the, um, the, the uh, actual native bone. In that case, we, we, did, we were concerned uh, with what the exposure rate measurement would be. Um, that patient only had actually two lesions that received three tiles in each lesion. And the exposure rate, that was that five and a half or 5.6 MR per hour at one meter. So if you had, uh, if you had more tiles um, in a, lar a large implant with non-native bone, uh, that, that's where you may run into issues where um, that patient may need to be ha have a little special atten attention in terms of um, uh, exposing members of the general public and the operating room staff. You may need to keep them a little bit longer. Um, there, there have been suggestions in the past of uh, having uh, some kind of um, shielding cap to be applied, which is something that could be considered also. Thank you. Um, related to that, does a patient need a shielded room after they receive gametile? Uh, typically, no. Um, it's, it's, um, we, we would never tell you not to take the extra precaution of, of doing that. Um, these patients can be uh, treated the same way you may treat a, a prostate uh, brachycede patient. Um, so if they are in a room, uh, we typically probably do recommend um, being in a room by themselves and then uh, keeping the uh, ICU staff maybe at the, their, their feet um, and away from their head as much as possible. But uh, there are no uh, regulatory requirements that dictate they need to be in a shielded room. Thank you. Um, is, do you have any information on CPT codes or reimbursement? Um, I, uh, I, I'm, that's not my uh, area of expertise. However, we do have a very nice document that can be provided. Um, yeah, if you get in touch with uh, customer support at gtmedtech.com. Is that right, Ashley? It's uh, customer service at gtmedtech.com. So, Kimberly, yeah. I can send you the coding and payment guide that has the list of all the CPT codes. Um, but they're the same codes that are used for brachytherapy planning. Yeah, and the, uh, the document is very nice. And uh, GT Medical Technologies actually has a, a coding specialist as well that can help you with those questions. Thank you. Um, how, about timing for the CT, why do you do it before releasing the patient compared to 30 days post implant? Yeah, great question. So um, we recommend doing that uh, that post op that CT post op within 24 hours, mainly because um, we haven't seen evidence that there's much. Um, uh, swelling in the brain that will shift the position of the seeds. Um, there was a, a time study uh, done, uh, study done where they evaluated the place the seed placement um, at various times after uh, various time points um, following implant, and they found that the seed position is not changing. By getting that CT scan within 24 hours, um, it can facilitate a much quicker dosimetry turnaround just to make sure that you're happy with um, the, the actual dose uh, being delivered by your gametiles. Um, and, and waiting doesn't really buy you much uh, in terms of the, of the seeds uh, shifting or any kind of uh, tissue uh, swelling reduction. Great, and then a related question, what is the time period before which the collagen dissolves? Um, so that's, uh, it's a good question. I'm not 100% sure of an exact number. Um, what I can tell you is that um, the 9.7 day half-life of the cesium, uh, so we know 10 half-lives is about 97 or you know 100 days, if you will. Uh, the collagen rem integrity remains throughout that 100 days. Uh, so by the time the collagen does start to kind of dissolve, um, the seeds have already delivered all the dose they're going to deliver. So that's not as much of a concern. Uh, however, uh, if you do reach out privately, I can probably get you uh, better better information on the exact uh, the exact properties of the collagen material. And um, Adam, I just spoke with one of our engineers about this. So it starts resorbing in six to eight weeks. So. All right, there you go. Um, it it kind of goes back to that uh, that that um, 
study. It was an AAPM poster um, that looked at uh, the, the C position uh, at different time points following um, following implants, and those seeds don't move much, which is kind of the most important takeaway. Thank you. Um, we got a question. What would you recommend um, physicists read if they're looking for more information on clinical efficacy? Uh, I would recommend that you visit uh, the gtmedtech.com website uh, or the gametile.com website. Uh, at both of those websites, we have uh, uh, several studies um, uh, that report clinical trial data uh, from gametiles for different tumor histologies um, versus different uh, different other alternative therapy types. Um, that that can really you can really pour through the clinical data uh, in those publications. Uh, and again, we are happy if you reach out privately, we can, we can get you some of that information. Thank you. Um, a question, is the TG186 model based dose calculation available commercially? Also for seed expansion, do you expand symmetrically XYZ or axially XY only? Uh, good question. Um, as far as the TG186, um, I, the, the, I, I've never seen it used clinically. Um, I think it is available on, in some uh, treatments, uh, playing softwares that are out there. Um, again, I've never used it. Um, I, I'd be interested myself to know uh, if people are, are using that. Uh, most of the clinical data that's being published um, that we're, we're quoting doses from utilize that TG43 model. So maybe that's why um, people are continuing to use the, uh, the homogeneous assumption. Um, it's a great question and I'd actually like to do some work uh, looking at um, effects of the, of the skull on some of these dose distributions, because that's obviously a, a large area of heterogeneity that um, gametile is commonly associated with. Um, and then the second part of that question was, remind me, Ashley, I'm sorry. Um, it was um, for seed expansion, do you expand ah, yes. symmetrically or axially? Uh, yeah, so that's uh, just a symmetric expansion. Um, we just, well, it, I'll be honest, uh, typically just use the, the um, native uh, expansion or contraction uh, tools in uh, the MIM software for the most part, and I believe that's a uh, uh, symmetric expansion. Thank you. What kind of radiation safety documentation do you provide patients upon release? Uh, yeah, great question. We do have a, a, a template patient document that we can give out that gives basic instructions um, regarding uh, avoiding, you know, uh, pregnant women or uh, ex ex uh, prolonged exposure to family members. Um, in the end, we, we do, uh, we, can, we can give you some recommendations and guidance on that. Uh, we do kind of, um, in the end, uh, um, allow your, your radiation safety program at your institution to have the final word on exactly what uh, guidance you'd like to give to patients. But um, as long as you're following that, um, the uh, regulatory release criteria, um, you know, patients are, are typically considered to be safe for, for releasing to the general public. Thank you. What is the typical exposure to staff during the CT? <clears throat> uh, during the CT? That... Yes. Uh, yeah, so I, during a CT, I would, uh, well, the um, that would just be kind of the standard, whatever, uh, you'd normally get, um, you know, at, at your facility for, for standard CT, the gamma tile wouldn't, wouldn't add to that. Um, in the operating room itself, uh, the exposure to the, uh, the OR staff, um, was actually assessed <clears throat> for, uh, cesium-131 stranded seeds, um, which actually was a really nice study done. Uh, and they found um, the exposure to members of the, of the operating room staff to be well below any kind of regulatory, uh, any kind of regulatory limits. Uh, we can provide that paper to you as well. Um, we've, we assume that uh, gamma tile exposure is even a little lower than that, just because of the, the, the speed with which these tiles can be placed versus a stranded seed. Um, the activities can be a little different, so that might play a role. Uh, however, um, that study did kind of show that it was uh, a safe procedure, as, of course, assuming uh, standard radiation safety practices are being, uh, being observed. Thank you. Um, we got a couple questions about the ordering lead time. So one question was, if you order by Monday, would you receive it um, by Thursday for a Thursday case? 
Uh, you know what? I would have to, um, if you don't mind, go back to my slide here on that. Um, I'll be honest, uh, that's a great question for our customer service team. <laughs> Sorry, let me oh. bring up the table. Um, Here we go. I will say there is some flexibility. So if you have a case present, definitely call our customer service team and we'll do everything we can to work with you to get the tiles there in time. Um, we ask for about a week timeline if possible, but we've had tiles delivered in as little as two business days and in certain situations. So. <laughs> Yeah, and just, just to uh, expound upon a little bit as to why that lead time exists, um, these tiles are built and then actually shipped to a different facility for electron beam sterilization. Uh, so that's part of the reason why there's a little bit of a lag um, as far as the, uh, the order and, and delivery date, but um, this is actually a pretty quick turnaround time. And, but again, as Ashley mentioned, uh, the GT medical team is, is, is really amazing working with you on these kind of things uh, if it's a quick turnaround time. Thank you. Um, we got a couple questions about MIM. So for post-implant dosimetry, is MIM capable of easily identifying the sources? And does the system use point source of line source formalism? Uh, great question. Um, yeah, MIM has a very nice seed finding feature. Um, it compares well to you know, some of the other commercial systems out there. Um, it gives you the ability to do auto seed finding. Um, as well as um, manual seed uh, finding or, or, or cleaning up what the auto seed uh, did. Um, so the, uh, the, the TG43 calculation performed by the MIMS Symphony software, you actually have the ability to specify if you want to do a point dose or a, a line source uh, formalism for that. Um, when, when you get uh, the MIM software as part of your, your gamma tile program, uh, we will go through and do uh, a training that will walk you through the, the workflows I mentioned. And at that time, uh, we can show you the, uh, the MIM Symphony uh, options with, with which to make sure your uh, TG43 dose parameters are uh, correctly in there for the, the seed that we're using. Um, because this is a commercially available seed, um, you know, those, those, uh, all those dosimetry parameters have already been uh, uploaded and that seed exists, but it's always, uh, you know, a smart idea to second check all that, uh, as well as um, verify the point dose versus line dose uh, uh, calculation. Thank you. Um, what is the process of bringing MIM into our hospital and how long does that take? Yeah, great question. Um, once, uh, once you've determined that you'd like to have the MIM software, um, it's actually uh, pretty quick and easy. Um, GT Medical Technologies will reach out to MIM and go ahead and, and uh, let them know um, that that needs to happen. At that point, a uh, member of the, the MIM team contacts you uh, for a demo and discussion of uh, where you want the uh, software to be uploaded, whether it's on a local box or a Citrix type server. Um, and at that point, we'll give you the minimum hardware specifications. Uh, and then that uh, the representative from MIM can sign on and get that software installed in, in an hour. Uh, it's, it's actually a pretty quick, easy process. Uh, then the training typically takes an hour or two, uh, depending on the number of questions you have. <clears throat> um, so it's, it's a nice process and uh, we can provide you with a couple of anonymized uh, sample patients uh, that you can use to, to uh, further your training and practice a little bit on some uh, practice patients. Okay, thank you. Um, besides the MIM training, do you complete any additional training for the physics department before the first gamma tile case or for ongoing cases? And if so, what does that look like? Yeah, so um, we will, uh, we're happy to do some Zoom training, uh, especially in this day and age when it's difficult to do uh, on-site um, trainings. Um, so, so I'll jump on a Zoom call with you and go through um, all these uh, steps of the process that I mentioned today. Uh, in as much or little detail as you'd like. Uh, additionally, and I'm probably more, even more important, uh, is when you do your first, first or second case, um, definitely for the first case, uh, we'll actually fly out and provide um, uh, clinical uh, expert expertise services. So we'll usually fly out a medical physicist, which is either myself or one of our other uh, physics consultants, um, as well as uh, usually a member of our physician team and we'll work with the, uh, the relevant entities. Uh, I'll work with the physicists or the radiation safety team uh, to make sure everything is uh, squared away, everybody's happy, there's no questions. So that on-site case coverage, um, I, I think people find it to be pretty helpful 
especially for that first case. Thank you. Um, we're running low on time here, but we have a couple questions left. So what do you recommend we do with the tiles or seeds if an order is canceled? Great question. Um, there's different options. Um, if a, uh, you have the ability, once, once if you miss that implant date, uh, at that point, because of the, the low half-life, um, the seeds are, are no longer recommended to be used in patients. Um, so they can be sent back in using that return material authorization form um, that I very quickly showed in this talk. Um, or since uh, the, we only do have a 9.7 day half-life, uh, depending on your local regulations, um, if you wanna just decay those for 10 half-lives, so about 100 days in your hot lab, uh, you can then just dispose of them as normal waste, uh, typically. Uh, again, depending on local regulations. So um, you can either decay on site, it's not too too bad of a, a decay time, or send them back. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a couple questions here about shielding. So do, does medical physics typically need any shielding when opening the sterile pack from the shipped shielded tray to the sterile field shielded tray? Sure. Um, yet uh, we, we typically, you know, obviously it's, it's up to you if you want to use any kind of leaded gloves or, or, or aprons or anything like that. Um, however, we find that uh, just uh, it's, it's very so quick to, to move the, uh, the tiles from one uh, from the unsterile tray to the sterile tray. Um, and then as long as you're keeping that tray closed as long as possible. Um, it's not really anything we ever really recommend. Uh, I would never tell you not to, of course, but um, we we uh, we don't we don't go out of our way to recommend it. The um, the you know the uh, 30 keV fall off means you don't need a whole lot of shielding. So it's something you could you could obviously do if you'd like. Especially uh, you know we'd probably recommend pregnant uh, workers or anybody like that. Um, stay you know stay away from the seeds, but you could always have a if if it had to be in the room, you could always have a, an extra uh, leaded shield there. Um, and that leads to uh, another common question we get, which is, uh, should the neurosurgeon uh, or radiation oncologist be wearing leaded gloves? Uh, our physician team actually recommends uh, not to, um, just because simply it uh, reduces your uh, dexterity and coordination, which increases the, the time for placement. And we, it's, it's uh, our opinion that uh, just a quick placement of the, of the tiles, getting the craniotomy closed uh, is your most effective way of reducing dose to uh, folks in the, in the operating room. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Turner. Um, that concludes our session for today. I know I, I have seen a couple more questions coming through. If you have any, please send them to customerservice at gtmedtech.com or to Dr. Turner's email that he's, he's getting <laughs> to right now. Um, we really appreciate your time and attention today. And thank you so much, Dr. Turner, for a great presentation. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. And thank you, for everyone, for participating. All right, have a great afternoon.